from one islander to another, Isle of Wight Radio proudly presents John Hannam Meets. Hi and welcome to the show. Today it's a Some Mothers Do Avum special. Later we'll meet the show's creator, Raymond Allen. My first guest will be Joe Pasquale, who's currently playing Frank Spencer in a nationwide tour of Some Mothers Do Avum. Heidi, hi! Hello listeners, you are listening to John Hannam Meets. It's always a great pleasure to welcome to John Hannam. It's the wonderful Joe Pasquale. Hello, John. How are you? Fine. Uh, a bit loud and, and crash there, aren't I? It's because it's a matinee day, that's why. Yes. Do you yes. like two in a day? For this show, I do. Generally speaking, um, if you're doing 12 shows a week, that, that gets a bit tiring. But with this, it's eight shows a week, and uh, I can do that uh, comfortably. But, yeah, i am just finished one show, as you know, and uh, ready for the next one. I've come up from the Isle of Wight, as you know, and you're coming to Portsmouth, very close to us, yes. Theatre Royal, 20th to the 24th of March. Yes, we are, yeah. Do you know what? When I was a kid, that was the first theatre I ever went to. Oh, really? Yeah, went it's across on the old paddle steamers. And, yeah. yeah, wonderful. Love it in there. So, about two years ago, I came down to Shankton Theatre to interview you, yes. and you said, I haven't got that much time because I'm meeting one of my comedy heroes in about 10 minutes. Yep. And uh, you said to me, do you know Raymond Allen? I said, well, he's a close friend of mine. Yeah. And that was sort of all about this, wasn't it? It was, yeah. And it's taken us two years to get this far. Uh, We've had three workshops on the the play and two years of working on the script. And it's just got to this point now where it's gone better than I could have ever hoped that it could have gone. Uh, The reviews have been amazing for it, for me and for the whole cast and for the play in general, four and five star reviews. Even Quentin Letts in the Daily I, Mail loved it. Can I know he that? did. Yeah, it's been, we haven't had anything less than a four star review. Amazing. And it is just the best thing to go out on stage and come to work and be Frank Spencer every day. It's a joy. Take me back to the original, because I know you love the original show, yeah, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, TV yeah. series. What did that do for you, really? I, well, I, it just reflected my own life. I've been accident prone all my life. I thought, this this is just my life. Huh? You know, that's what it's always been for me. And so now, 40 odd years later, uh, to go out and be him and just put the beret on in the Mac. What's magnificent about this was a real clever move on Guy Anz was the director. It was on the very first run through of the, of the workshop. We both decided it would be a mistake to try and do an impression of Michael Crawford. So I don't, I just do it as me. And within two or three minutes, the audience buy into it with less than that even. The minute I go through the door and go, hello, Betty, I'm home, that's it. Frank's in. Frank's in the building. And they, they don't question it. It's amazing. I was petrified that the audience would go, oh, sorry, that's not Michael Crawford. No one ever questions it. It's just... It's big. The reason why, I think, is because I'm not acting. I'm just being myself. And they can buy it. They go, oh, OK, well, that's... It's very believable because that's what he's like. There aren't many around today that could do that, but you're certainly one of them, as you're proving, really. Well, yeah, it's more luck than judgment, really, but it's the stunts that are killing me, John, as you know. Those, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, particularly one at the end, um, down the stairs, that one... Um, yeah, do what you don't know, because, uh, uh, you know, in the first half, I, I might, well, you, do, you know this, but I had my trousers off a bit in the first half, and my legs are black and blue. I have to put makeup all over my legs to cover the bruises, otherwise people would go, my God, look at his legs. Now, I want to know, Joe Pasquale, there was a fantastic story in The Sun yesterday. Yes. Was that um, true? Or was Absolutely, it, completely was true. It? Yep, it happened again last night as well. No. Yep, it did, because uh, now, because I'm having to get extra more pence now, because there is a scene, as you know, which is quite um, physical, and I'm in my pence at the time, and uh, I didn't know what was going on. It did say five minutes, but it wasn't five minutes, it was only about you know, 20 seconds, but it was long enough to know it was there. So you were inspired a bit by Raymond Allen years ago then, really, weren't you? Very much so, yeah. And Ray came on the opening night in Swindon and he came to our press night here this week and he was so nervous, so nervous about it. He was more nervous than I was, even though he hadn't written this version, but just to see how it was going to be accepted. And uh, he was crying at the end of it. It was amazing to see him. It was just wonderful to see this little, little old bloke sitting there crying at it for the right reasons, obviously. You know all the early stories of Raymond and how he sort of went to Michael Crawford's house and he didn't know Michael was doing his Frank Spencer. No, I know. And it was just... He's just... He is Frank Spencer, Ray, isn't he? He is. When you meet him, he looks like Tony Hancock, but he behaves like Frank Spencer. (laughs) Years ago, when he was a schoolboy, he was one of the fastest runners on the Isle of Wight. 
they had a relay team that were very successful on the mainland, and yeah. Ray was one of them. Really? Yeah. Oh, my God. A yeah. relay team on the Isle of Wight. That's a long old relay, that is, isn't it? Yeah, tell me. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you're really delighted how it's going, as you said. Yeah, we're talking, they're talking to some uh, Australian producers now. Uh, about taking it to Australia and uh, trying to find a, a small West End venue to put it in for next year as well. Whether that all comes to fruition or not is, a, is another matter, you know, show business is like, but that's the plan at the moment, is to Australia and then the West End. I'm going to mention some dates a bit later on because this goes on to a, a national podcast. Yeah. So, and you're going right on till about June, aren't you? Yeah, July, end of July, July. we go on to, mate. Yeah, another, wow. we've got another 20 weeks to go, something like that, yeah. Well, if I survive that long, the stunt. So are you not doing one of your normal summer seasons? Yeah, this finishes on the 29th, I think, of July, something like that, and then two weeks later I start my own um, stand-up tour again. I think I start on the Isle of Wight, maybe, something like that, I can't remember where, but yeah. Um, yeah, back on the road again for 40 dates doing that, and then Panto in Nottingham. Oh, Nottingham? Yeah, doing Peter Pan with John Chalice, so that'd be are nice. Are you? Yeah. Oh, my daughter yeah. Caroline's a great friend of John Chalice. Oh, is she? Oh, um, she's she has still working, go- is she still in the town and she's doing the show? She? Yes, she's just yeah. finished The Exorcist yeah, and I now know, she's yeah. gone on to a Vita. I wish she had good for her. And good. I think that she's staying with the Chalices in a few weeks' time. Oh, fantastic. So there we go. That'd be great. So, looking back on your career, we've talked about it many times, but it's been fantastic, hasn't it, really? Yeah, this is a highlight. Now, I have to say, out of all the things I've ever done, there's a, as you know, on this play here, I'm on for two hours. I'm on, there's 125 pages of dialogue, and I'm on 123 of those pages. I had to learn it all word for word before I got to rehearsals because it was so physical to, you know, you dive under there, do that, you lift the settee up there, you go stick your head through there, you do this, and then you fall down there, and you can't do all that with a script in your hand, so you have to know the words first. So that was a real challenge on its own, just learning the words. Then putting the physicality to that was a huge challenge, uh, but because of it, it's paid off in dividends. And uh, it's the best job I've ever had. Regardless of anything else I've ever done, this far exceeds anything I could have hoped for. Can you add lib a bit? No, I'll do it at all. Physically, I do. I yes. change things on a physical I'm side. I'm sure do. you do. But on the lines, you can't. Because there's six other actors out there waiting for their cue. And, it's, and also, because it's farce, it's a British farce, it's a whodunit, it's a farce, it's a love story, it's all of those things. It's a bit like um, Columbo, I suppose, as well, in, in mixed up in there, a little bit of this um, thing that goes wrong in there. But... Yeah, there's no room to ad lib because if you did it, it'd ruin the rhythm. The whole thing is a, it's like a song. And if you come out a line and you come out a rhythm on it, the whole thing falls apart. When you started doing these shows like The Producers and other stuff like that, did you find it difficult not to ad lib? No, not really, no, because you know it works. You know, the producer, when I've done the producers, um, you know, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, the nerd, all this sort of stuff. When a, when a, when a, a genius writer like... Um, uh, you know, Mel Brooks gives you a script. What, why would you change a word of it? You don't need to change a word because it works. It's like it's like painting by numbers. It's like comedy by numbers. And Guy Unsworth has that skill with the script. You don't. But in, in saying that, we both worked on it for two years. The script. There was a lot of my input in it anyway. So we honed it right down. Got that. Got rid of the stuff we didn't need. That was just you know dead wood on it. And now it's like a, it's like a, a greyhound of comedy now. Can I just ask you about the uh, Palladium show with yeah. Bradley Walsh? Because yeah. you sort of. <laughs> Made a dramatic entrance, entrance every, week. every week. Yes. How far advanced did you know? I what? never knew until the day I got there. Really? No, they wouldn't tell me until the day I got there because they'd see what costume was available from Angels in Islington or wherever they were getting it from. Go, okay, they come down to the spaceman today. Really? Okay. Jack Sparrow today, but you can't mention Jack Sparrow because it's uh, Disney, so you're just a pirate. Okay. Yeah, whatever it was. Phantom of the Opera. Okay, you're in. Yeah, I loved it. You and Brad work well together. You've known each other a long time, haven't yeah, you, really? Yeah. I think he's when he does that show, he's perfect for it, well, isn't he's, he? He's a, he's a great all-rounder. He's the best all-rounder out there at the moment, yeah. You see how he's got everything going. You can sing. He can't dance. I'm saying that he can't dance. His legs are too chunky from his football days. But, yes. Yeah, but he can He can really sing and he can act. He does comedy, he does present, he does a lot. Yeah, he's great. When you had a, a top five album, did you tease him a bit? Or oh, not? God, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could sign. I could send him to him. Can you sign me one? I want to use it as a tea coaster. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Whenever I talk to you, you're always studying something or other. What, what, what's your... Well, at the moment, I'm working on my second book, because my first book came out at Christmas, as you know, Dead Knobs and Doomsticks, and uh, it's been uh, in the Amazon charts all the way through. It's, uh, apparently, a couple of weeks ago, it was in number one in the downloads in, in Canada, number four in Australia. I've never been there. Um, and it's still in the charts in Amazon now on the ghost stories. And so I'm working on the second book at the moment, uh, Dead Knobs and Doomsticks 2, uh, Dying for a Sequel, it's called.
<laughs> so what's there left for you? Because you've, you've done everything you've wanted to do almost, yeah. haven't yeah, you? Yeah, I think I have. I want, I want to do Strictly still. I'd love to do Strictly before my knees give out on me after this show. You won in the jungle, didn't you? Oh, I won the jungle, yeah. done that for, it was 14 years ago now. Was it? Yeah. Just looking back quickly, was that good for your career? Did it oh, introduce yeah, you to... Oh, yeah, new yeah. audience, all that sort of stuff. But all these things, everything is peaks and troughs in this business. And as I've got older, you realise that the, the thing uh, to aim for um, isn't about doing telly, isn't about doing films, not being about doing West End. It's doing nice shows with nice people. And that's it. You know, you can't um, get caught up in the ego of everything. You just want to work with nice people all the time. You flying much or not these Hardly days? Hardly anything at all, only because of work. I'd like to do more flying, but uh, you can only do it when the weather's good and when I'm not working. And invariably, um, those two don't often meet up. Just before you go, I know you've got another show to do. Other than flying, when you're not working and studying, what else do you do? I like to run and box. I still get beat up a lot down the gym. I go to a boxing gym in Eltham called Gumshield. Do and, you? And, yeah, people are always uh, punching me, which is great. I like that. And um, what else? I read a lot and uh, I'm writing most of the time. Joe, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. I often think back to when we first met. Yeah. Warner's Benbridge. I was going to say it's on the Isle of Wight again. And you yeah. were, with due respect, you were virtually an unknown. Oh, completely, you? yeah. Yeah, just done new faces. That was it. That was 30 years ago, John. Do you know that? So you must have exceeded any dreams oh. that you had. Well, the fact that I'm still here is a, is a miracle, really. You know, yeah. I'm still doing it. I, you know, I never expected any longevity out of it. I thought it would be a laugh for a couple of years and see what happens. And here I'm, 30 years later, talking about going to the West End with some others do have them. It's amazing. Wow. Going back to Warner's, obviously, it's slightly different now because they don't get the star names at Warner's. But no, they it, don't, do it's, they? It's, it's, but it was a great breeding oh, ground for you. I, and, I, and I still, occasionally I do. I'm not very often... But I still love those venues. They're great. They've just got so much atmosphere to them still. I love the story about Nodes Point when you... And the bingo. Yeah, go on. Just yeah. tell me. I love that story. Well, I, I was doing it again. I can't remember where I was doing it again. It was on the Isle of Wight, but I was yes, doing it, it again was. somewhere else. And I went over to see a few friends at the Ents Ent team that were working at Nodes Point. And uh, it was just getting ready for bingo. So I said, look, I'll go and call the bingo if you like. Because I haven't done it for a few years. I missed doing it. And I went out and done it, and no one believed it was me. They thought, well, this looks like Black Blood Joe, but it can't be him, though. And, of course, no one knew it was me. They, they thought it was someone that looked a bit like him and sounded like him, but they didn't believe it was me at all. <laughs> Today we're at Richmond Theatre. The last time we met was in the Loose Women studio. Do you what remember was, that? wasn't it? How could I forget? You and me were the Loose Women. <laughs> yeah. I always remember rushing home and calling up and watching the show. That was, yep. Is that daunting? No. No. No, this is daunting. Loose with five minutes with um, Janet Street Porter. Anyone can do that. <laughs> yeah. Did I ever tell you that only two people have ever asked me for money for an interview? Who were they? One of them was Janet Street Porter. Yeah. <laughs> and the other one was supposedly Tony Meehan of The Shadows. Yeah. But it wasn't Tony Meehan. Who was it? I don't know. He's an Some imposter. Bloke. Yeah. <laughs> I went and looked. Did you pay? Did you pay them? I tell you what I did. I knew where he drank, and I went and looked through the window. Yeah. And somebody said that's Tony Meehan at the bar, and yeah. I knew it wasn't Tony Meehan. Right. So did you pay Janet? No. <laughs> I didn't do it. <laughs> I said I've had Charlton Heston and John Mills and yeah. who else on yeah. this show. Never paid them. You know. Yeah. There we that's go. Funny. Joe, thanks for your time. Thank you. On a busy always. day. Thank you. I love the up. show, and uh, if Quentin Letts liked it, well, yeah. most people are going to love it, aren't yeah. they? It is amazing, yeah. Thank and you. I hope uh, you do well in Portsmouth, 20th to the 24th of March. Thank you, thank you for talking to me, John. When a lot of your fans from the Isle of Wight will be coming over. Hopefully so, yes. And uh, wish you lots of luck, as ever, Joe Pasquale. Thanks, John. Lovely, thank you. Thank you, love. Put that light out! I'm trying to relax and listen to John Hannum. Grateful thanks to Joe Pasquale. Always such a pleasure to interview. I did promise some dates. Following the Portsmouth Theatre Royal, the tour of some others do have them, goes to Crewe, Aberdeen, Eastbourne, Northampton, Dartford, Wolverhampton, Crawley, Tunbridge Wells, Plymouth, Ipswich, Harrogate... Hull, Darlington, Norwich, Leicester and Southend. Over the years, I've interviewed Raymond Allen on numerous occasions. I want to go back today to an interview I did at home with Raymond just a couple of years ago. So we're going back to the creator of Some Others Do Have Them in 2016. <laughs> Oh! <laughs> 
another Hannum archive. I started from school at the Isle of Wight Times. Would you tell me that classic story? Yes, I was 16 years old and I was put in charge of births, marriages and deaths because no one else wanted to do them. My first writing job, I had to go out to Binstead, the local village, um, because a man had died and, and I found out that he'd only died two hours before but the paper only came out once a week and he died on Wednesday morning and we came to print uh, Wednesday evening so he said you'll have to get his obituary so I was t- given a list and I went out there and I was so nervous I walked up and down the hill and eventually went to the house and the, I said could I write something about your husband and I'm sorry to bother you and and she said yes that's fine come on in and she said would you like a cup of tea and I thought well she's really bearing up very well and I said well can I ask you a few questions about him she said well yes but I think you ought to see him first it would be right. And I said, well, where is he? And she said, well, he's, well I've left him in the front room. <laughs> and I, I thought, grief. She said, you, if you go down the hallway, you can't really miss him. I thought, well, no, it's a dead body in the house. You know? And I went down, and I remember, never forget it. He was lying across the couch, and he had one shoe on and a hole in his sock, and he just had trousers and vest, and he had a copy of the Isle of Wight Times over his face. And I thought, talk about disrespect for the dead. You know, he's just collapsed and they just left him. And so I was standing there looking at him and I noticed the newspaper going up and down and I was looking round for where the draft was and I heard this terrible noise and when I looked, the paper was sliding off his face and he suddenly sat up <laughs> and belched and looked at me and absolutely terrified and I ran through to the kitchen and, and said your husband's just sat up and she said well ask him if he'd like a cup of tea (laughs) and I said no he's supposed to be dead and she said no that's the man next door (laughs) you've come to the wrong house but but it's funny people have always said to me are you like Frank Spencer and I said no no I'm nothing like him because he's destructive and he's bad luck you know and all this when I started thinking about my life I realized everywhere I've been has either closed down or gone bankrupt. And the only place that ever survived unharmed was the castle. And I was thinking about this, and the following Saturday, I heard the fire engine go down, and of course the castle caught fire. They had to practically totally rebuild it, you know, and it was... um... Then I worked at the cinema at the Regal. Yes. I was only going to be there. I said, do you mind? I'll only be here about six months, because then I'll be going to the BBC... And then five years later, they finally <laughs> contacted me. But there was a story at the time it wasn't funny. Whenever I went to these places, no one ever thought I'd be a writer, you see. And when I was at the Regal Cinema, I finally got this letter from the BBC saying, we want you to come up to London and talk about your script. and We'd like you to work for us. And so I went into the cinema the next day. I was so excited and I said, well, I've got some news for you all. And they all gathered round and I said, I've been offered a job at the BBC Television Centre. The BBC want me to work for them. And there was a long silence. And then one of the cleaners said, well, I can't understand that, why they want you to work for them. You'd think they could get their own lavatory cleaners. (laughs) The idea of me going up as a lavatory cleaner... (laughs) You had a phone call there once, didn't you, <laughs> from the BBC? Yes. Ah, oh, it was so difficult. Before you tell me the story about the, the cinema, tell me how you coped, because there was a, just one, one telephone box in Hayley. That's right. And there was a local telephone box, and that was right by the bus stop. And every time you had to time your script conferences to be in between the, the Haven Street bus, you know, it was terrible. I don't know how I did. You know, just one phone box in the village. And you had this big, long script you had to change. Yes, and, and then also I never had the sense to reverse the charges. Never occurred to me. And I'd go in with a sock. I used to have a sock full of coins, and I'd be putting the coins in, you know. And it was a nightmare because I, at one time I was working for Frankie Howard and he was so long-winded. 
you'd phone him up and he'd say, oh, I'll just put my dressing gown on <laughs> and put the kettle on and that would be another five shillings, you know. So there you were living in Highlands and, and no phone. And tell me the story now then about Shanklin when they rang you up from the BBC, didn't they? they wanted to speak to you. Yes, when I was at the BBC one day and uh, this man came up to me and I told them when I went to the BBC, they said, we want you to write a series, but we don't know when we're going to do it, so don't give up your day job. And I said, no. And they said, well, what, what do you actually do? <laughs> and I didn't have the nerve to say, well, I clean the toilets at this local cinema. So I said I was in the film business, you see. <laughs> and they just accepted it. And then... Um, this man came up to me in the bar and he said, I understand you're, you're, you're writing a comedy series for the BBC and you've had experience in the film industry. And I, I said, oh, yes. And, and he said, well, we, 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 we need someone to write a screenplay for a film. He said, it's a really big film and the writer's dropped out. Would you do it? And I said, yes, oh, I'd love to. I'd please. He said, well, I'll, I'll keep in touch. He said, I'll give you a ring. And what's your phone number? And because I didn't have a telephone, and I thought if I tell him this, he's going to think, what sort of idiot is this? Uh, writes films and hasn't got a phone. <laughs> so I said I'd just moved house, I had trouble getting a line. And he said, well, I'll phone you at your office. And I said, oh, I'd like to get out and see things firsthand, you know, and where the action is. And he <laughs> said, well, there must be somewhere I can contact you. And I said, do you know the Isle of Wight? And he said, no. And I thought, that's good. So <laughs> I said, well, there's a place at Shanklin called the Regal, which is very grand. I usually have my morning tea there, you see, <laughs> which I did in between cleaning toilets. <laughs> so he said, well, I'll give you a ring. What's the best time? I said, about 10 o'clock. When I got back to Shanklin, I said, look, if anyone phones up asking for me, don't tell them what I'm doing here. Just call me. And a couple of days later, um, I was called to the phone and he said, I, I'm just checking, are you still interested in writing a film script? And I said, oh, yes, please. He said, well, in that case, I'll go ahead. We're going to arrange a meeting in London next week and I'll get back to you and tell you what day. He said, now, before you hang up, can you put me through to the manager of the establishment? I said, why? He said, well, the receptionist that answered the phone was really very rude about you. And I'm not putting up with it. He said, I phoned her. And I said, is that the Regal Shanklin? And she said, yes. And I said, is Mr. Raymond Allen the television and film personality in the building? And she said, yes, he's always here about this time. <laughs> and he said, well, can you page him for me? And she said, could you call back in 10 minutes? He's just mopping out the gents, you see. <laughs> and it was awful. I was so stunned, I couldn't think of how to bluff my way out because there was a long silence. <laughs> and he said, what exactly is the Regal? Is it a hotel? I said, well, no, actually, it's a cinema. And he said, well, you weren't really cleaning the toilets, were you? <laughs> I said, well, I'm getting material for a script. <laughs> He said, well, how long have you been there? I said, four and a half years. He said, it must be a very long script, you know. And I said, you will phone me, won't you? Yes, I never heard from him again. No, I was going to say, I don't no, expect you got the job, did you? No, it's not the best way of getting a job, is it? Obviously, you created Frank Spencer, yeah. which was absolutely fantastic. And I love the story of when you first met the guy that was going to play the part, really. That's, yes, Michael I'd, Crawford, of course, yes. I'd never met him before. And he's one of these people who spends hours getting into the part and apparently been up... We'd arranged to meet at 10 o'clock at his house and he'd been up since about four deciding how he was going to play Frank. And he actually came to the door in character, <laughs> you know, with the voice and the walk. And I kept looking at him and thinking, well, I hope, he, you know, I know he's a good actor, but... This is really, I didn't think he'd be like this. And, uh, and then he said to me, I've been sent a copy of your script. He said, I've memorised the first scene between Frank and Betty. So he said, if you breed Betty's part, I'll, I'll be Frank. He said, so I'll go out that door and then I'll come in as Frank Spencer. And he went out. When he came in, he was exactly the same <laughs> as when he'd gone out. And I didn't, I just kept looking at him. And he said, have you noticed I'm sort of moving, twitching a bit? I said, I thought you were nervous. He said, no, I'm acting, I'm acting. And he said, what do you think of my voice? 
I said, oh, don't you normally talk? Like, no, he said, no. And then he said, have you noticed the way I'm walking? I thought he'd had a hip replacement, you know, and it was just extraordinary. But he was perfect for it. You couldn't imagine anyone else doing it, could you really? Not. No, it's remarkable how he, yeah, how he did yeah. it, really. The first episode, I think, was 1973, February That's the 15th. Right, yeah. And did you only make just over 20? Was that a fact, Raymond? 22 with yeah. the three Christmas shows, wow. including... Yeah. Did it take you by surprise? Because all of yes. a sudden, it was must-see television, wasn't it, really? Yes, because it was difficult. Because even after I'd written the first series, I'd written seven scripts. And then no one wanted to do it. Because it isn't really a gag script. You've got to sort of see it. And and with the script, you can't tell how, what, how he's going to speak. And I mean, the way he said it was beautiful, but um, no one wanted it. it. Was turned down. Norman Wisdom turned it down. I met him years later, and he said it was he, it was a, one of his regrets that he mm. turned down the part. He would have been good. Wouldn't he he? would have been good. And I loved him then. And but he said he didn't think it was funny. He said he liked the character, but he said I suppose he puts the funny lines in later. And they said, no, that's the complete script. And he said, there's no laughs in it. And then Ronnie Barker turned it down because it was too physical. He said it was too much movement in it. And um, everyone, even Jim Dowell, I think, was was turned it down. Really? And there was... Uh, they were trying everyone. There was one Herman and the Hermits, wasn't it? Peter Noon. Yes, they sent it to him even because they said he, he's a very likeable young chap yeah. and he'd be good. He turned it down. And then I suggested someone, I said, why? We had a meeting at the BBC and they said, we've been trying for a year to get someone interested in, in this Frank Spencer thing. No one wants to be Frank. No one wants to direct it. And he, he said, we'll pay you for them, but it'll never be seen on television. I, I said, why don't we get someone who isn't famous, someone on the way up? Because they grab at it, the chance to... Mm, mm. And, and, you know, a supporting actor and... They said they couldn't think of anyone. And I said, there was a chap I saw on television a little while ago, and he only had a few lines, but he was so funny. I think he'd be brilliant. And they said, yeah, and I told him who it was, and they said, yes, he's a very good actor, but only as a supporting role. They said he hasn't got the charisma, the star quality, to head a series. If he was the leading man, it would be a disaster. And that was um, David Jason. Really, yeah, he was. I'd seen him in some small part. Amazing, and it was about. This was about 1971. When you think the man is is brilliant, isn't he? Yeah, and you had to do a few scripts rather quickly, didn't you? Once they liked it, once yes, it, once, it was a hit. Yes, it's, it, it was a bit frightening. It was in the drawer for about two years, and then they phoned me up and said, "Do you know a actor called Michael Crawford?" And I'd only seen him once. They said, well, he, he wants to do a television series. And we, we've said we've got this series here he could have a look at. Do you think he'd be any good? And I would, if, if they said to me, you know, Jack the Ripper wants to play, and I would have said <laughs> he'd be brilliant. You know? So I said, oh, I'm sure he will. And, and uh, did the first series. They wanted one every two weeks, yeah. Well, that was super smashing great, wasn't it? Jim Bowen here, just reminding you, you've been listening to John Hannum on Isle of Wight Radio. Joe Pasquale is actually one of the featured chapters in my brand new book called The John Hannam Showbiz Interviews, featuring nearly 100 stars that I've interviewed during my 40-year career as a show business broadcaster and journalist. If you're interested in this book, please go to my website, johnhannam.com, and click on the writing page and you can find a direct link to where you can purchase a copy. Keep looking on the Isle of Wight Radio website, the John Hannam website and YouTube for more John Hannam Meets new interviews. Bye-bye for now. Isle of Wight Radio